Lauren, it's been roughly about six years since Broken Monsters, and I'm sure fans are just clamoring to get their hold on something new from you. So uh, what inspired Afterland? Just talk to me about the process of getting there. Definitely. So it's been five years of writing it, and um, it's about a mom on the run with her son who's one of the last survivors of a plague which has killed 99% of the men. And he's happens to be a genetic survivor, and there are a whole bunch of people who want to get their hands on him. Um, what I was really interested in doing when I started writing the book was to kind of play with the idea of gender, and especially the way we talk about teenage girls' bodies and how they're commodified um, as kind of sex objects or reproductive resources. So that was an idea that I really wanted to play with, and also the journey of motherhood and how much you have to sacrifice, how much of yourself you lose in that. Um, but also how rewarding and amazing that relationship is uh, between a mother and son or a mother and child. Um, and yeah, the plague was basically this global pandemic was a way of dealing with, of trying to get to this world where most of the men were extinct. Um, and it's been quite alarming to come out of five years of writing a fictional pandemic into a real one. It's been fairly <laughs> horrifying, really. Well, that was flows into my next question because I have now you the third person that I've interviewed third author who's written a book before coronavirus and it's come out now during this pandemic so do you guys have some kind of crystal ball or something that you <laughs> can um well it has made me really think about what I want to write my next book about and maybe something much happier like no more global pandemics for sure um look I mean you know, I mean, the research was fairly standard, like a plague and a pandemic does play out in like X number of ways. So there have been some reviews which have been talking about how prescient it is. And I'm like, yes, but if you do a plague novel, that's what it's going to look like. Um, but yeah, I think it's just really unfortunate timing, actually. Um, and I'm a bit nervous that people won't want to read it because we're living through a pandemic at the moment. But I think the focus of the book is that it's post-pandemic. It's about the aftermath. It's about the afterland. And it's also been interesting to see the ways we're talking about our own afterland in South Africa, you know, and what the landscape is going to look like after Corona and how we can be more of a connected community and how we can actually reach out across the divide between, you know, rich and poor and the economic divide and the race divide and maybe imagine a better future for ourselves, which is what my heroine is doing in the book is she's trying to imagine a better future for her child. Um, and get him to a place in the world where he's not treated as a sex object or a reprodu reproductive resource or a matter of future security, where he can just be a boy, where he can just be himself, where he's not reduced to kind of his, his biological gender. Talk to me about how you develop the characters. Um, I think that's part of the reason this book took me so long was because my own kid was much younger when I started writing it. So I started out trying to write a younger kid and Miles just didn't have the agency um, because I think where a lot of the friction in the book comes from is actually their relationship between the mother and son. You know, she's on the run. She's taken some quite violent measures, you know, and certainly illegal um, activities to get him to this place. Um, so there's a lot of tension there already, but there's also just kind of adolescent tension. And the fact that he's like 12 on the cusp of being 13, um, is starting to get really rebellious and fractious and kind of pushing back against his mother was a really fun thing to play with. Uh, and and I, wanted, I needed him to be like a full human and to be very much coming into himself, which is not to say that younger kids are not full human, but I needed him to have that real sense of agency and that sense of very strong sense of self to be able to play with. In a lot of dystopian novels, you find that it's women who are under threat. And in your novel, it's men who are under threat. So, I mean, was that kind of like a screw you patriarchy type thing? I think that's definitely a theme in the book is screw you patriarchy. But yeah, I did, I did specifically want to gender flip that, you know. And also I wanted to flip this idea that we have about what a world that was only woman would look like. And of course, in South Africa, we have this incredibly high rate of gender-based violence, which is just horrifying and awful and devastating. And that includes like the queer and the trans community as well. And I really wanted to kind of play with this idea that, yes, a world without men would mean that we could walk alone at night. And how wonderful would that be? 
but women are also full human beings and women are just as power hungry. They're just as corrupt. They're just as capable of like great evil as much as they are capable of nurturing and love and kindness and tenderness. But it's not all going to be communal gardens and kumbaya. You know, the power structures are still in place. Um, the people are power hungry and drugs and gangsterism and violence are going to continue in slightly different forms. But sometimes the gangsters, as in the book, feel that they have more to prove because they're women and they have to prove that they're even more hardcore than the men were. Talk to me about some of the reaction that you've received to the book. Well, I've had a lot of kind of, oh my gosh, so prescient, are you a sinner? Uh, I'm like, no, no, it's just good research um, and bad timing. But yeah, I think a lot of people have reacted very strongly. And I think there is actually an, appet an appetite for pandemic novels at the moment, especially where we see what happens afterwards. Um, and I think that's what fiction does, is it allows us to imagine uh, other selves, other worlds, other ways of being. Um, fiction is kind of a way of expanding ourselves, of experiencing these other lives. So the reaction has been really positive so far. It's been featured in the New York Times and O Magazine. Um, and yeah, and, and I think the fact that at the heart of it is this kind of mother-son relationship and then also this kind of incredible tension and difficulty between two sisters where the villain of the story is a, is a woman, you know, it's not a man. Um, I think there's been like a lot of really interesting reactions and I think the world that we're living in at the moment where gender-based violence is so high, where we're just seeing a whole new round of Me Too and sex predators in the comics industry, in the literary industry, um, it, it just feels quite relevant, I guess. I wish it wasn't quite so relevant, but in, in all ways, but yeah. So one of the groups that we encounter in the novel is this very odd fundamental religious group. Um, and I just wanted to ask, did you set out to address fundamentalism? Look, I mean, I think in any kind of end of the world scenario, there is going to be, you know, incredibly crazy fringe groups. Um, and in the book, we see we see variances of that. There's a terrorist group uh, who believe that we actually need to finish killing all the men um, and bring about the end of civilization. But there's also this uh, troop of nuns, and they're part of this church called the Church of All Sorrows, which does not exist. It's entirely fictional. And they believe that God has punished us by taking away all the men. Um, and it's because of women's sin and not obeying our husbands or being obedient enough or talking too much. Um, you know, all those womanly, those womanly sins, we shouldn't, if we just hadn't committed those, everything would be okay. So I did want to play with that level of, um, the kind of the, the, those kind of hypocritical aspects in religion and also to really play with this idea um, that to the church, Miles, who's on the run and hidden amongst them, would be the chosen one. And of course, that's a really powerful narrative. And it's not just in religion. It's also in our popular fiction. You know, Harry Potter is the chosen one. Neo from The Matrix is the chosen one. And it's almost always a man. So it's a very powerful narrative that's going to get its hooks into Miles as well. Talk to me about your writing process. How do you go about it? Uh, a lot of procrastinating and then a lot of panicking. I think it's kind of mix, a good mix of both of those. It's interesting, although I've written now five novels, a pop history, a short story collection, several graphic novels, uh, a couple of kids books, I still struggle with imposter syndrome. I still kind of feel that I'm not good enough and that, the, well, not that I'm not good enough, but that the work isn't good enough. And I put myself under tremendous pressure. And on the one hand, that's, that's great because it forces me to push harder and to kind of push my writing further. But on the other hand, it can be crippling and it's, it's always going to be this balancing act of trying to get over your inner critic and just getting the novel down and like getting it out there. Um, but yeah, you know, I think I, I've had a lot of like kind of new writers approach me and they're just gobsmacked that I still deal with imposter syndrome at my level. Um, but actually my psychologist had a great way. Um, she had a great way of putting this, which is that the reason I've been, I was struggling so much with this book was because although her metaphor was that although I'm a mountain climber and I've conquered many peaks before, this mountain is different. And that was such a great analogy and a great way of understanding why it doesn't get any easier and why each book is still hard and it's still a slug because it's a whole different mountain that you've got to figure out the way to the top and there are false routes along the way. Um, and you can do it, but it's 
it's hard and it's challenging. Do you begin with characters? Do you begin with this, the plot and fill, fill out the characters as you go along? How does it work for you? It's all very organic and it all kind of plays out at the same time. So a plot with no characters is a Michael Bay movie. Lots of explosions, um, some slow-mo shots, but there's nothing really for you to connect with. And characters with no plot is Waiting for Godot, masterpiece theater, but how many of those do you actually want to engage in where just nothing happens? So for me, it's a very organic process where they're very intertwined. Um, I do start with a strong sense of who my characters are and they'll often surprise me. Um, there's a subconscious process which happens between the moment you think of what's gonna happen and your fingers actually on the keyboard that something shifts and something changes. And I guess that's the creative magic of writing is, is having it kind of steer off in a direction you hadn't expected. But I always have a very strong sense of where the story is going and, and how these characters are gonna develop along the way, the huge challenges that they're gonna face. And then there's still a lot of room for the magic to happen as well. Absolutely. So a few years ago, with one of your other books, The Shining Girls, there was talk of, I don't know, was it a movie I think it was? because somebody had optioned the script. Do you know what's happened with that? Yeah, so we've been through a couple of iterations now. Any any movie adaptation takes a long time. Um, it's currently in development as a TV series. I can't say anything about it right now. Um, I'm hoping for good news soon, but it might also just be more hurry up noise. It's exciting to talk about, but it's a long process and most stuff that gets optioned never gets to the screen. Um, even in such, you know, in the golden age of television. Um, I did want to ask, I know the book has just been published, but do you immediately start working on the next thing or do you take a bit of a break? I've had a little bit of a break because you have to remember that like the editing finished in kind of November last year and then we've just been doing copy edits. So it's an ongoing process, um, but it's been finished for, you know, a good nine months now already. So I have started working on the new book. I don't want to say too much about it. Um, and, but yeah, you know, I'll just, I'm going to keep writing and keep doing interesting things. Um, it's, I, I love being able to tell stories and to be able to do that for a living. It's a huge privilege. Um, and to have people engage with your world and like really connect with your characters is a phenomenal thing. Talk to me about the importance of genre fiction. I studied science fiction film as, as part of my master's degree, and you come across a lot of people who scoff at genre fiction. Um, you know, you know, it's not literary enough or, or whatever. Just talk to me about the importance of writing genre fiction. So I think genre fiction, you know, and high concept ideas give you a different way of looking at the world. So you know, I could have written a novel about how men are just as oppressed by gender expectations as women are um, and how problematic it is the way we talk about teenage girls and how much we reduce them to, you know, um, their bodies or their sexual attraction or sexual value. And that would have made a really great essay, but it wouldn't have necessarily made a really engaging book. Um, and I think putting this huge twist on reality, but it's still recognizable as our reality, allows us a different way of seeing and engaging with an issue. You know, The Shining Girls, although it's about a time traveling serial killer, it's fundamentally about misogyny and about how we talk about the victims of violence and how they're often reduced to the pretty corpse, the pretty dead girl, or just the absolute horror of what's been done to them. And we lose sight of who the person was. And again, I could have written a very powerful essay on that, but doing it as a book with characters you care about and this kind of high concept which allows you to engage with a topic that maybe we've talked to death and it's very tiring and it's emotionally draining to engage with the real life instances of this. Genre can be a different way of getting at that and getting through you. All right, Lauren, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. It's an absolute pleasure. It was a delight chatting to you. Thank you.